Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next scheduled item of business is a statement by Angus Robertson on benefits of independence. Yesterday afternoon, significant news that should have been announced in this chamber as a matter of courtesy and respect to the Parliament was reported by national media, trailing a media event this morning. Long established good practice guidance on announcements by the Scottish Government states that announcements by Government on matters of importance should not enter the public domain before or without being communicated to the Parliament. Where the subject matter relates to matters on which members of the public would have a clear interest, there is a strong expectation that the ministerial statement would be scheduled with appropriate notice, and where that ministerial statement has been programmed, the details of the statement should not be released to the media before the statement is made. Now, it is not possible to square the Government's actions on this matter with respect for this guidance, which is designed to ensure that this Parliament is given its proper place. It is my role to represent this Parliament's interest, and in doing so I take account of all members' interests equally. The Government is in no doubt that I do not regard this as acceptable, and in these circumstances the Parliament's time is used best by moving straight to questions, and I call Douglas Ross. Thank you. Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And this side of the Chamber has heard very clearly you standing up for the role of this Parliament and parliamentarians throughout the parties. And I have to say I'm sorry that the First Minister could not be here to listen to your views in person. Because what we heard from Nicola Sturgeon today was an announcement that there will be more resources and time of the Scottish Government wasted on their drive to separate Scotland all over again. We heard from the First Minister that Scotland now faces a clear choice between two futures after the crucial years following COVID. We can focus on rebuilding Scotland or, as the SNP want, on dividing Scotland, pushing for another divisive referendum, perhaps even an illegal wildcat referendum, as Nicola Sturgeon suggested earlier, is the wrong priority at the worst possible time. The people of Scotland want the focus to be on the huge challenges facing us. We want the focus of this government to be on creating better jobs and opportunities. We want the focus to be on improving public services. Instead, this SNP government just offers more distraction, disruption and division. In the middle of a global cost of living crisis, the SNP are diverting resources and public money away from the front line. Nicola Sturgeon pushes her obsession with separation by asking, why not Scotland? So let me ask a better question. Why not improve Scotland now? Why not use the powers of this Parliament that you have right now to improve the lives of the people of Scotland? Why not create better Scottish jobs now? Why not restore Scottish schools now? Why not tackle Scotland's drug death shame now? Why not build a ferry in Scotland now? This government is obsessed with independence when it should be obsessed with delivering for Scotland now. Mm -hmm. So can I ask the government just one thing? Please, give it a rest and focus on the priorities people across Scotland have now. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding uh, Officer. Clearly, it's an inconvenient truth for the Conservative benches that 72 of 129 members elected by the people of Scotland last year were elected on a manifesto commitment to deliver an independence referendum during this parliamentary term. That independent supporting majority is larger than at any previous Holyrood election. For anyone who believes in parliamentary democracy, which I assume, which I assume is all 129 members of this place, that should not be shrugged off as an inconvenient fact to be ignored. It should instead be taken as a democratic instruction from the people of Scotland. Those on the opposition benches are there because they were rejected 
by the people of Scotland on their anti-independence ticket. This government was elected because we are committed to the people having their say. And this paper, Madam Presiding uh, Officer, provides a crucial context for the rest of the independence prospectus series. I note Douglas Ross had, did not have a single question relating to the document that was uh, released today. I commend it to the Parliament, I commend it to colleagues, and I look forward to debating the independence referendum, which, which we intend to take place uh, next year, following the express wishes of the people of Scotland, who had elected a mandate, uh, elected a majority of MSPs to this place to hold such an independence referendum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I move on to take a question from, from Sarah Boyack, can I ask any members who wish to ask a question to please press their request to speak buttons now, and I call on Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is clearly going to be the first of several last-minute announcements where the First Minister makes the press announcement, then the Cabinet Secretary comes to the Chamber so we can ask him questions about a lengthy report just published. Has the Cabinet Secretary not appreciated the irony of launching a report which talks about the importance of doing better a week after his statement on this year's census failures, which he was in charge of but has yet to take responsibility for? With with hundreds of thousands of Scots facing with hundreds of thousands of Scots being forced to choose between heating and eating, surely we need to build recovery. Surely, 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 presiding officer. Colleagues, colleagues, colleagues. We are not going to get very far this afternoon, and unfortunately we're not going to be able to take all the members who really want to ask a question if I have to keep asking um, for a bit of quiet for the member who is speaking. Even where we disagree with one another, we all owe each other the courtesy and respect of hearing each other respectfully. Ms Boyack. With hundreds of thousands of Scots being forced to choose between heating and eating, surely we need to build recovery from the pandemic and fixing the pressures our NHS faces because of SNP mismanagement. Today's report outlines how we could be like other nations but is it not true, Cabinet Secretary, that this Parliament could make similar decisions now on cooperative energy, but this SNP Green Government decided not to follow the example of Nordic countries, instead deciding to sell off our seabed? And when the report says that an independent Scotland could not be transformed to match the success of the comparator countries overnight, given that we've been told it would be Brexit times 10, will the Cabinet Secretary admit it would make Brexit look like a walk in the park? Cabinet Secretary. No, I don't, I don't agree with the uh, Labour spokesperson. Independence is about the recovery of Scotland, the recovery of Scotland from Brexit, the recovery from Tory rule, the recovery from Boris Johnson. And at the heart of this, it is a question of democracy. And what is sorely lacking, unsurprisingly from the Conservatives, but disappointingly from the Labour front bench, who have a long tradition of supporting Scottish uh, democracy, is an acknowledgement, a basic acknowledgement, that an election was held last year and that candidates that supported a referendum taking place on Scotland's independence won the election, and the Conservative Party and the Labour Party lost the election. Moving on to the substance uh, of uh, the issue, Scotland is not a region of a unitary state. We are a country in what the Welsh Labour government calls a voluntary association of nations. We have a right to decide our own future. All of us should support that. As Democrats, we should endorse the fact that a referendum should take place. We will be on different sides of the argument. But please, don't deny the people of Scotland their say, which is effectively what we were hearing from the Labour front bench this afternoon. Yeah. Alex Paul Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the First Minister describes Scotland as a nation in waiting. Presiding Officer, we are exactly that. We are a nation in waiting. We're waiting for ambulances and cancer care, long COVID clinics and mental health appointments for our children. We're waiting for overdue ferries and replacement bus services for cancelled trains, for progress on pupil attainment and the climate emergency. We're waiting for help with the biggest hit to household incomes since the end of rationing. 
Presiding officer, we are tired of waiting. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary why every single one of these priorities has now fallen behind the breakup of the United Kingdom in the queue for this government's attention? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, now, now we have all of the opposition uh, par parties lining up in their agreement of democracy denial. It is a sad day uh, that illiberal, illiberal anti-democrats stand up and suggest that we should not go forward with a democratic vote about the future of the country. It's frankly shameful. We will be on different sides of the argument about Scotland's future, but please don't come here to the chamber and say the people of Scotland can't have their say when they voted an election that they should be able to do just that. Michelle Thompson to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Michelle Thompson. Presiding officer. They say that change is made inevitable when parties fundamentally diverge based on their values. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree it's important to contrast our vision based on democracy and ethical values with that of a UK failing state? In particular, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that today's news regarding the willingness of the UK to break international treaty obligations and domestically to shield dramatic levels of financial corruption is merely a glimpse of the folly of dependence, whilst independence is a harbinger of a very different and better future? Well, I agree, with, I agree with Michelle Thompson that a better future is possible, and that is what we are steering towards. What has been published today is an analysis that compares the UK with all of our neighbouring states uh, – Ireland, Iceland, Norway, uh, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, uh, Austria, Switzerland, Belgium and Netherlands. They are our neighbouring uh, countries. What do they all have in common? They are all wealthier, some significantly than the UK. The wealth gap is lower. The income inequality in those countries is lower. Poverty rates are lower. There are fewer children living in poverty. The comparative countries have higher social mobility. Most have a smaller gender pay gap. The comparative countries have a higher productivity than the UK. Gross expenditure and research and development is higher in most of the comparative countries. And business investment is higher too. That is the difference between the United Kingdom in 2021 and all of our neighbouring countries. The time is coming for us to embrace a better future. We will do that through a democratic vote for independence. We have an option. It is the status quo of a Brexit Britain under Boris Johnson or an independent Scotland run by the people who are actually elected by the people who live in this country. Murdo Fraser to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Have the Scottish Government law officers been asked to give an opinion on whether a referendum run without a Section 30 agreement be lawful? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, today's statement is about the opening publication in the series. Members, thank you. We will hear the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. In, indeed, Presiding Officer. And as the First Minister uh, said earlier, this is the first in a series of publications. Further uh, uh, publications will, will follow in the series, which will cover the full range of issues, including how a referendum will take place in Scotland. And Murder, Murder, Murder Fraser will just have to calm his jets. Calm his jets. Cabinet Secretary. But I, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I am fairly sure that all members a year on from the election are aware of the fact that if I have not called them to speak, they should not be speaking. Cabinet Secretary. I pretty much said everything that needs to be said to Murdo Fraser, but perhaps, perhaps, but, but perhaps I can use the opportunity at the end of my answer to him to invite him, I hope as a fellow Democrat, to agree with me that given the people of Scotland have voted for a majority in this Parliament, that there should be a referendum, that he agrees that that should take place too. Christine Graham to be called by Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Eight years ago, in 2014, pensioners were told to vote no or they would lose their state pension. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me, a pensioner, that Scotland's pensioners with one of the worst state pensions in Europe and now each losing £500 a year as the UK ditches the triple lock would indeed benefit from independence? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. I, well, 
The, the, the facts are there for, for all to see in terms of the level of pension in the comparisons with, a, with other countries who are significantly better off than pensioners are uh, within the UK. The issue of pensions is something that um, uh, will be explored in greater detail um, in one of the forthcoming papers as part of the series. Um, but it is a statement of fact that pensioners in the UK are significantly worse off as part of the UK, and I look forward to them having a better future uh, in an independent Scotland. Paul O'Kane to be followed by Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Light on detail and heavy on cherry-picked examples, but the First Minister did confirm one thing today. She said, if we are in the single market and the rest of the UK is outside the single market, then yes, there are issues in terms of regulatory and customs requirements. The Government paints a rosy picture of trading bliss within the EU, but glosses over the barriers and challenges that lie in the way. The paper published today says next to nothing about the actual practicalities of independence. So will the Cabinet Secretary take the opportunity now to confirm to democratically elected members in this chamber, as the First Minister did in her answer to a journalist, that with independence there would be a hard border between Scotland and the rest of the UK, and what analysis has the Government done on the impact this would have on Scotland's businesses, economy and wider public services? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's, it's obviously news to the Labour Party that a border is already being built because of the UK decision to leave the European Union. B border infrastructure is currently being built in Scotland, in Scotland, to deal with trade between Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland. That is the fact of the situation. It is happening already. Uh, can I say to the, the member, this will be the subject, the issue of borders, which is a perfectly legitimate uh, area of inquiry, is going to be in a future uh, document, at which stage, no doubt, at which stage, well, there's obviously great demand for, for these, for, Thank for these you. sessions, we will and I look, the forward, I look forward tremendously, despite the, the full outrage on the Tory uh, benches, I look forward to being able to discuss all of the areas as part of the prospectus and the run of, up to the referendum, and in the in the same way, I'd like to extend my hand to colleagues on the Labour benches, as I have to colleagues on the Conservative benches, to find agreement on this one point, if we're going to disagree on everything else. As Democrats, please, can we sign up to the fact that it's the people of Scotland who are sovereign, they voted to have a say on the subject, and that's exactly what they should have. Emma Roddick, to be followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's an exciting moment in these challenging times that we're living through to be discussing the opportunities of Scottish independence. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the Scotland we see now offers hope for the positive, progressive vision of independence that we can pursue more fully with the full powers of independence, such as a social security system that treats people with dignity, fairness and respect, a sustainable and affordable housing system that is fit for the future, an entrepreneurial economy that promotes, promotes world-leading standards in fair work and well-being. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I totally agree with Emma, Emma, Emma Roddick. And to, to be able to deliver all of those things, we need to have the powers in this Parliament to be able to make the decisions about the ambitions which she has outlined. And that is exactly what this government uh, is, uh, is committed to do. I hope when we move past the faux outrage that we've heard from uh, the opposition members whose parties lost the election on this issue, that we can actually move on to the substance of issues like pensions uh, and others. I look forward to us being able to debate that in the months ahead and look forward to moving on to the referendum campaign uh, itself. And it would actually be, it would be welcome if colleagues from the opposition parties would be able to get up at any stage and be able to point a rosy or better picture of a Scotland as part of the the United Kingdom as part of Boris Johnson's Brexit Britain. Liz Smith to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, well, let me try something that was said by Professor John Kay, leading economist and former adviser to the Scottish Government, who warned that an independent Scotland would start off with £180 billion of debt and be forced to borrow £20 billion annually to plug the huge black hole in public finances. Does the Cabinet Secretary seriously believe that saddling Scotland with this level of debt is either fiscally prudent or what businesses in Scotland really want? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, what, what Elizabeth Smith failed to mention is the United Kingdom has had one of the biggest debts of any country in, uh, in the European uh, Union. So we'll take, no, we'll take no lessons from the Conservative front bench. I, I, think, I think it is eminently better for us to be able to make decisions closer to home on all of the key issues. And I invite Ella Smith, please have a look at the document which uh, rests on reputable uh, high standards of statistics from the OECD and others. And please ask yourself, why is it the case that all of our neighbouring countries are significantly better off than Scotland was in the United Kingdom? I know it, it must be a very difficult read to be confronted with the facts, but the facts are the facts, and they show that it is our neighbouring countries that are significantly better off, and I suggest that that is a much better future for Scotland rather than a United Kingdom and its mountain of debt. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's always better to make your own decisions than leave them to your next door neighbour. And for unionists, the time is never right. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that from Australia to Canada to New Zealand to the United States, which had to fight for independence, not just vote for it, Scotland, like other independent nations, will flourish with the self confidence, ideas, and in innovation independence inspires, able to harness our economy and natural resources, working globally as an equal partner in the family of nations to deliver prosperity for all who live and work here? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I do agree with uh, Kenneth uh, Gibson. Not only will we, we, we be one of the wealthiest countries to have become independent, we will have more institutions in place in the run-up to the forthcoming referendum than we had in the run-up to the 2014 uh, referendum. And I think that's, uh, that will give a great many people who are open-minded about the prospects of, uh, of voting yes the assurance that they need to know that a Scotland in charge of its own destiny is significantly better than leaving it up to people that we haven't elected. Incidentally, a party that has not won a single election in Scotland since 1955 to make bad decisions on our behalf. I think there is a better future in prospect. Um, there will be different views about the merits of the case. What we should all agree, though, on is we have elected a government to deliver on a referendum. That's exactly what should happen. Ross Greer to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you. Today's paper notes that inequality and poverty are lower across a number of countries comparable to Scotland. Given that organised workforces are the most powerful way to raise wages and thus lift families out of working poverty, and the UK has some of the worst anti-worker and anti-union laws in Europe, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that independence gives us the opportunity to instead make Scotland one of the best countries in the world in which to work and to organise within your workplace? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, yes, it does. And that's exactly what our, our neighbouring countries have done. But one of the, the interesting... Um, aspects of the, the research on this question is there is not a, a fits-all approach across the comparative countries, across our neighbours. There are different models. Some he might find um, closer to his political heart, and some might be approaches that um, centre-right politicians would take a, a different view on and think that's the right way to go for it. But what's interesting is all of them across the piece, almost without exception in terms of the metrics, uh, are better off. So what appears to be key to all of their success uh, is that they are able to make better decisions for themselves. And I would say, incidentally, with the exception of Switzerland, every single one of our comparative countries has, in relatively recent historic memory, been part of a wider union and decided that it is better for them to make decisions closer uh, to home. They managed it. I'm sure we'll manage just as well. Emma Harper, to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Independence will allow all decisions over every aspect of Scottish society to be put in the hands of the democratically elected Scottish Parliament. Can the Cabinet Secretary reaffirm that this will allow this Parliament to reverse the harms created by consecutive UK governments and to build a fairer and more inclusive Scotland which values human rights as well as the well-being of our citizens and that no government should deny the people of Scotland the right to take this decision? Cabinet Secretary. In, it, in, indeed it is, but it's much more than just about ameliorating harms. It is about making better decisions for the future. And one of the things that's very close to my heart and should be to um, the majority in this chamber across the parties uh, who believe that being within the European Union is where we should be, is I look forward to the restoration of everybody's citizenship rights in this country as an EU citizen. There is absolutely no chance that either a UK Tory uh, government or even a Labour UK government is going to see 
um, Scotland as part of the UK re-enter the European Union. The only way to do that um, is for Scotland to be an independent member state and us to rejoin the European Union. And in all the conversations I've had with a great many European politicians, there is a significant appetite for Scotland becoming a member of the EU again, and I look forward to that greatly. Stephen Kerr to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This whole statement and this morning's media circus is a shameful deflection from the priorities of the people of Scotland. The SNP's agenda of separation is rarely, if ever, stated as a priority by the Scottish people. The SNP like to talk about anything other than the people's priorities. Today, my colleagues and I submitted a raft of urgent questions about issues impacting the everyday lives of the people of Scotland. Health, education, transport, justice, net zero jobs. But no, here we are talking about the same old SNP obsession. So let me help the Cabinet Secretary. Will he apologise to this Parliament and the presiding officer for the contempt that he and his boss and his government have shown this Parliament today? Talk, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, talk, talk about uh, deflection, um, Presiding Officer. I'm just asking myself whether the Stephen Kerr that just asked that question is the Stephen Kerr who ran in the Scottish Parliament elections last year in Falkirk West and came third. Because if that is the same Stephen Kerr, and I imagine it is, I'm seeing it's not the same Stephen Kerr. It was another Stephen uh, Kerr that stood in Falkirk West. No, I do think it was. I do think. I do think it was Stephen Kerr who was. Uh, who was defeated in Falkirk uh, West. Why this is relevant, Members. why this is relevant, why this is relevant, is that in that election, Stephen Kerr stood in that constituency asking for the votes of electors there in opposition to a referendum, and he lost. And the candidate standing for the Scottish National Party in that constituency won. I know humility doesn't come easy to Stephen Kerr. It doesn't. But perhaps as a Democrat, a fellow Democrat, hopefully he is a fellow Democrat, he will acknowledge as an election loser that the people that won and the government is in office was elected to deliver a referendum and that is what should take place. Point of order. Point of order, Jamie Green. Can I just confirm, uh, Presiding Officer, can I hope that the Cabinet Secretary is not inferring in any way whatsoever that regionally elected members of this Parliament are in any way inferior to constituency members? Because if, if that is the case, he should apologise to each and every one of us. Thank you, Mr Green. Um, as that is not a point of order or a matter for the Chair, I will move on to the next question. And I call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I start by reminding members I didn't come third? Uh, and can I ask the Cabinet Secretary <laughs> how this government can give us a date for a preferred referendum, but not a date for closing the education attainment gap? And what does he think that says about their priorities? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, look forward, I look forward to the proposed uh, date for the independence referendum being confirmed uh, in good time. It will uh, be taking place in the autumn of next year, as was outlined uh, by the government. That is, what, that is what this government has been elected to do. That is what we are working towards. And I would hope that Conservative members will impress on their uh, UK colleagues given a great many quotes from many people, including, I, I came across an interesting uh, quote from, uh, from Ruth uh, Davidson on this very question, who said uh, that uh, if political parties get over the line and can make a coalition, make a majority, get the votes in Parliament, then they'll vote through a referendum. That's what democracy's all about. Hope, hopefully the Conservative benches still agree with that. Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Some of the rhetoric we've heard in this chamber would paint independence as a terrifying, unprecedented journey and a terrible risk for Scotland. But can the Cabinet Secretary point out, as this new paper so clearly lays out, the many examples we have here in Northern Europe and across the wider world, illustrating the simple fact that independence is normal for middle-sized internationalist progressive democracies such as our own. Cabinet Secretary. 
So I, 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 totally, uh, I totally agree, and I would just observe, of, of the ten comparative countries, so these are our neighbouring comparatively sized uh, countries in Northern Europe, nine out of the ten were, were previously in unions or governed neighbouring countries or governed by neighbouring countries. Not one single one of them has thought it a good idea to give up on their independence and return to being governed by a neighbouring country. It's good enough for them to govern themselves. It's more than that. It's much better than how we are governed in par as part of the UK. It's a great idea. The fact that they've all done it should give us inspiration. We should get on with it. Yeah. And Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Health inequalities and poor life expectancy are exacerbated by a welfare system that punishes and sanctions. That is the view of subsequent and successive panellists in the Health Committee the last month. Is a Scottish social security and welfare system one seismic opportunity for the people of an independent Scotland who have suffered by being dependent on our broken institutions of the UK for decades? And don't these people deserve a chance to vote on their future? Cabinet Secretary. Y yes, they do. And obviously, there is now a developing Scottish social security system. However, the majority of powers in terms of social security still rest uh, with the UK government. We have shown already that with limited powers we can do much. With independence we can do much more. An additional reason why we should have the referendum and why we should vote yes in that referendum. It will be transformational for people in this country. Thank you. That concludes the ministerial statement on benefits of independence.